ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين قال الله تعالى في التنزيل العزيز بعد نقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون وقال يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد Today I'd like to share with you a story from the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام سيرة the life of the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام particularly from the Hijra of the Prophet from Al Mecca to from the city of Mecca to Al Madina Al Munawwara uh, the story of the Sira uh, of the Hijra excuse me is really long and it is something that uh, in the uh, narrations of uh, Al Bukhari for example and in the Ashabu Sunan it's actually a fairly long uh, and very involved uh, narration i want to share with you a small part of it i want to share particularly the part from where the prophet ali sallallahu alaihi wasallam finally finally reaches the uh, place of quba and built the masjid al quba there so it is narrated by imam al bukhari rahimahullah falabitha rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam fi bani amr ibn auf bid'a ashrata laylatan wa ussisa al masjid alladhi ussisa ala at taqwa wa salla fihi rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam the prophet alayhi sallatu wasallam uh, remained the area where the Masjid Quba is, that was the tribe of uh, Banu Amr ibn Auf, and he stayed with them for about 19 nights and established Masjid Quba there and prayed, upon, uh, prayed in Masjid Quba. Masjid Quba in the Quran is referred to as the Masjid that is built upon Taqwa, right? The Masjid that is Ussisa ala Taqwa min awwali yawm. From the first day, it was built on the foundation of righteousness and piety. Uh, then ثم ركب راحلته uh, فسار يمشي معه الناس حتى بركت عند مسجد الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم بالمدينة وهو يصلي فيه يوم إذ رجال من المسلمين uh, وكان مربدا للتمر لسهيل وسهل غلامين يتيمين في حجر أسعد بن زرارة رضي الله عنه the Messenger of Allah وسلم, leaves Quba, Quba to the modern day the place, Masjid Quba to the Prophet's Masjid is about a 30 to 40 minute walk if you were to walk it today um, and maybe like a 5 minute uh, drive. Um, so he, mess, he وسلم, went from there but he's proceeding slowly with the people, the people are coming with him and as he is uh, riding his camel, the place where his camel uh, rests that place uh, was, uh, it belonged to two orphans, two orphans by the name of Sahl and Suhail. And uh, it was what's called a mirbad. A mirbad was an area where they would dry the dates. So they would take the, to pluck the dates that are ripe from the date palm trees and they're moist and rutab. And then they would dry them and for storage purposes, consumption purposes and whatnot. Uh, so the Prophet Rasulullah When the camel sat down uh, at the place, the Prophet said, This is insha'Allah Al Manzil, this is the place. That's the spot. Walhamdulillah. Thumma da'a Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al bil mirbad masjidan. the Prophet invited those two young orphans and said to them, uh, he wanted to purchase and wanted to negotiate the price with these two orphans so they could become the masjid of the Prophet uh, In another narration, it says فَقَالَ لَهُمْ يَا بَنِي نَجَّارِ ثَامِنُونِ بِحَائِطِكُمْ هَذَا He said to the people, uh, Bani Najjar was their uh, tribe, he said, uh, you know, name your price or let's negotiate a price من الثمن ثامنوني uh, Let's determine a price for this piece of land So they said to Rasulullah unsurprisingly, uh, that we don't want money, but nahabuhu laka ya Rasulullah, we are going to give this as a gift to you. فَأَبَى رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ أَنْ يَقْبَلَهُ مِنْهُمَا هِبَةً حَتَّى بْتَعَ مِنْهُمَا ثُمَّ بَنَاهُ مَسْجِدًا وَطَفِقَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ يَنْقُلُ مَعَهُمُ اللَّبِنْ 
في بنيانه ويقول وهو ينقل اللبن اللهم إن الأجر أجر الآخرة فارحم الأنصار والمهاجرة. The Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام refused to accept this as a gift. He wanted to purchase purchase the land and thus the purchase was complete uh, after the land was fixed up and uh, you know evened out for uh, the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام and the Sahaba began the construction. Of the Masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. And he ﷺ himself was actively involved in the building of this Masjid. He would ﷺ take the bricks and he would take them and carry them and put them in the place uh, where the Masjid was being built. And he would raise the spirits of the people by singing uh, you know, a line of poetry. He would say, Allahumma inna al ajra ajul akhirah, farham al ansara wal muhajira. Oh Allah, only the true ajr is. The Ajr of Al Akhira. The only true life is the true life of the Akhira. This is temporary. This life is very, very small, very short. Uh, you know, it doesn't really mean much. It's only a preparation for the real life. So Allah have mercy on the, uh, the migrants. Al Ansar, uh, the inhabitants, the natives of Medina, and the migrants, Al Muhajira. Uh, the ones who came from Makkah. This is the end of the narration of Al-Bukhari. In another narration, uh, we find uh, Ammar ibn Yasir عنهما, one of the earliest Sahaba, one of the esteemed Sahaba, whose parents were the first two martyrs of Islam. Ammar ibn Yasir, his uh, father Yasir and his mother Sumayya, the first two martyrs for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He saw Ammar carrying Yahmilu uh, he's carrying two bricks at a time. So the Prophet uh, The Prophet went to Ammar and dusted off the dirt from his head. You know, because when you get you're working, you get dusty and dirty. The Prophet is wiping it off from him affectionately, endearingly, and asks him, Ya Ammar, why don't you carry it brick by brick like the rest of the people, like your friends are doing? So Ammar says, فَرَدَّ عَلَيْهِ قَوْلًا إِنِّي أُرِيدُ الْأَجْرَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ Ammar says, I want the ajr from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm putting in the extra work because I want extra ajr. That's what Ammar was saying. And keep in mind, Ammar is no recent sahabi. He's not just any person who accepts Islam. His family was tortured. Severely. They were burned in the sun of Makkah. They were roasted on the sand, the burning sands of Makkah. You know, they were buried inside the sand, like, so it's like an oven to cook them. You see, like their head would be above the ground and their whole bodies are inside the sand. And that was the situation that Ammar endured and survived as a young man to finally make it to Medina. And yet when he reaches Medina, he's not happy with all he has done. He's not happy that his parents were the first two martyrs of Islam. He wants to really build his legacy. And he truly wants to build or get the ajr for the work. So he's putting it twice the work. That is how the Prophet ﷺ raised the Sahaba. That's how he molded and shaped them. That for them, what mattered, brothers and sisters, was working for the Akhirah, was building something in this world that would live on after them so that the ajr of it will continue and they would seek the rewards of it in the Akhirah. Something that will continue after they died. And they were never satisfied عنهم, from what they had done. Continue to work. It was never like, okay, I'm good. The Prophet told me I'm going to paradise. I'm good. Let me relax. That was never, ever the case. They always kept going as hard as they could, as best as they could. عنهم. That for us, brothers and sisters, is the example. And that for us is the lesson from this story. There is also other lessons like the Prophet ﷺ was a principled man. He was a man of principle. From the very beginning, he was called As-Sadiq Al-Ameen, the one who is truthful, the one who is uh, trustworthy. His dignity, his honor, his principles were never in question even by his enemies. Hmm? How can a person be claim or how, how can a person claim to be a uh, adherent of the faith of uh, of Islam, a follower of the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and they don't have principles. They flip flop easily. They're like you know, like we say in, in Urdu, we have a saying like you have a, a platter and you put eggplant on it. 
right? And you roll the platter this way and the eggplant goes this way. And you put it this way and the eggplant goes that way, right? You say, Thali Gabagan, that's what it means. are like unprincipled. How can a person be an adherent or claim to be an adherent of Islam when they have very few principles to stand by? The Prophet, even though he had all right to accept something that was a gift, was a man of principle. Wanted to make sure there was no scope for like controversy after him. Wanted to ensure that these two young uh, boys probably were being pressured by society. How could you sell your land to the Prophet ﷺ? Just give it as a gift. Right? Put yourself in the shoes of those two orphans. They would really not know what to do at this point. The Prophet ﷺ is the one who stepped in and made sure they weren't pressured. And forced to pay for the land that he was been given for free. Sallallahu it tells you he was a person of true principles and truly making sure that everybody was taken care of. Um, and of course also that he participated. He wasn't just talk. He wasn't just talk. He wasn't just someone who would say a few nice words and then retire to like his quarters. He was a man of action, والسلام, When the Sahaba would, when the Prophet would say to the Sahaba, whoever has man kana lahu Whoever has the food of two people, take a third with you. Feed a person who is poor. The narration of Bukhari that describes how the Sahaba would take people with them for uh, dinner. Those who didn't have anything, those who were homeless. وَكَانَ مَعَهُ عَشَرَةُ رِجَالِ The Prophet would take ten people. People would take one or two. The Prophet would take ten people and feed them. And he probably had the least of all the others who were feeding. He was a man of true action, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, and this story demonstrates that, and gives us a glimpse of that. Um, and our last note about this, and then I'll conclude in the, last, in the next khutbah, is the Prophet's masjid that was being built was a masjid that was very, very unique. Of course, it's the masjid of the Prophet, sallam, But the purpose it was being used for was extremely unique. It's mentioned that it is used for ibadah, taban, for prayers. It is used for al-hukm al-qada, which is basically like a little court. Rulings were issued there. It was used for idarat al-dawla wa siyasa. Discussions took place in the masjid of the Prophet, sallam. The dispatching of the army would happen from the masjid of the Prophet, sallam. The shelter for the homeless وَمَأْوَى لِلْفُقَرَاءَ مِنْ أَهْلِ الصُّفَّةِ The people of Ahl al-Sufa, most notably and famously Abu Huraira, who didn't have a home in Medina, who didn't have family in Medina, who couldn't afford to buy anything, lived in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. The masjid served as their home. It was a shelter for those who didn't have any place. And it was a place مَنَارَةٌ لِلْتَعْلِيمِ وَالْ it was a place to teach people reading and writing and education. It was truly, that was the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, and that's what he built ﷺ, and then the generation that he molded from it. They didn't stop. They kept working until the last breath. <laughs> <clears throat> the reason why I'm sharing this story with you is for all the beautiful lessons in this story that we can take from uh, the life of the Prophet. Anything we study from the life of the Prophet, we can take many, many lessons from it. But particularly the lesson of being motivated to work for our Akhirah and not let an opportunity pass. Not let an opportunity pass us by when it comes to doing something for our Akhirah. That is the most important lesson to take here. And for us right now, there is an opportunity. For us as the community of London, the Muslims of London, we have a golden opportunity. An opportunity unlike any other that has come by us in recent times. An opportunity for true Sadaqah Jariyah. Like the Prophet said, إِذَا مَاتَ ابْنُ آدَمٍ قَطَعَ عَمَلُهُ إِلَّا مِنْ ثلاث. When a person dies, their good deeds stop. The bank balance stops, it doesn't grow anymore. The only way it can grow is from three ways. Number one, sadaqatun jariyah. A continuous charity, a project, an, an, an act of, uh, of an endowment that continues to live on after the person has passed away. Uh, uh, knowledge that people are benefiting from, something that this person has taught and people are 
continuing to be better because of his teaching. And lastly, وَلَدُ صَالِحٌ يَدْعُوا لَهُ A righteous boy, a righteous child that makes dua for this person. And in fact, Ibn Baz rahimahullah says that this is for da'watul muslimin. This is actually for anybody. Anybody who makes dua for you after you passed away, that dua is going to increase you in ajr, will increase you in standing in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that, you know, people will only make dua for you when you do something for them. No one makes dua for Fir'aun. No one makes dua for people who've uh, oppressed. People only make dua when we mention our scholars, rahimahumullah. Make dua only for those who've done good by us. That's the way to leave a legacy. With that, we do people, and then people and their kids and their grandkids will remember us in their duas. So now we have this opportunity for our Sadaqah Jariyah that the masjid is uh, looking to expand and has a property very close by, not even 500 meters, not even 600 meters away from where we are right now. An expansion for our uh, school campus, an expansion for, expansion for our educational services, an amazing place where we can continue to grow as a community, a place where all of us can leave, a lasting endowment, a lasting sadaqah jariyah. Imagine the people who participated in the building of the Masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. How many, many deeds, how many good deeds they are banking while they're in their graves. And imagine now the loser who sat and watched the masjid of the Prophet being built and did not participate. How, how insurmountable is that person's loss? That is how we need to think. This is our opportunity. This is our opportunity to do something where once we pass away, the good deeds accumulate because this is a sadaqah jariyah. The knowledge being taught for those who will live by it, who will be molded by it, and they'll be benefited by it. The kids who study there, their du'as, you will get the portion of the ajr of those du'as. I encourage you brothers and sisters to participate, to, th uh, to spread the word. If you can't finance the building, be like Ammar who carried the double bricks. Abba who did the physical work if they couldn't finance something. A good word. The one who points to goodness is like the one who's done it. Whatever way it is, brothers and sisters, we have to put this forward for the community, but Allah will take care of the community. Most importantly for us, for me as an individual, for you as individuals. It's our legacy that we have to worry about, just like the Sahaba عنهم, worried about it. Like Ammar says, Inni uridu al-ajra Allah. I want the ajr from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa to give us the tawfiq to understand the Quran Sunnah and to implement in our lives. Inna Allah wa malaykatuhu yusalluna ala nabi. Ya ayyuhu al-ladhi na'amunu sallu alihi wa sallim taslima. Allahumma salli ala muhammadin fil awalina wa fil akhirin. Wa salli ala muhammadin fil malai al-a'la ila yawmidin. Allahumma ahina ala sunnatihi wa amidna ala millati wa hashunna fi zumratihi wa sqina min hawdi ya rabbal alameen. Wa ma'ati nufusana taqwaha wa zakiha anta khair wa zakaha. Anta waliha wa maulaha. Rabbana atina fi الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وكنا ذبنا رقيم الصلاة